Hello, um, welcome to Show Studio's fully digital live panel discussions in collaboration with Harrods. For spring summer 2021, experts from all parts of the industry will debate the most exciting brands and discuss London Fashion Week over the last five days. I'm Joshua James Small, so I'm the chair. I am a sustainable women's wear designer, freelance writer and model with first model management. I'll let my guests take over, starting with you, John. So uh, hello there, my name is John Matheson. I am the writer and curator for the Instagram page McQueen Vault. And um, I'm slowly uh, looking into kind of exploring other things. Currently that takes all my time enjoying kind of looking into that world, but uh, discussing all the facets of fashion. So I'm very excited to be here. So thank you, Joshua. Alejandro. Hi, um, I'm Alejandra Munoz. I'm a fashion designer. I am mostly the women's wear. Um, I graduated last year from Sandra and Martins and have been uh, building my own brand since. Also doing some um, modeling work to be able to pay the rent. <laughs> so yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Cool, and Charlie? Hi, I'm Charlie Howard. I'm a model. It's in between size models. So um, I'm not quite plus size, not quite straight size. Um, and I also own my own skincare brand called Squish Beauty. Fantastic. So we will start, I won't give my favorite looks to start with because I wanted to go around and see what everyone um, thought, but I'm very aware that I don't want to bias, um, give a bias to anyone. So if we start, we'll go in reverse. We'll start with you, Charlie, then to Alejandro and then to John. Um, so we'll work back. If you let me know what your favorite brand was and perhaps your favorite look and we'll discuss. Yeah, so my favourite show so far in London has been Erdem. Mm -hmm. um, they're always very whimsical anyway, but this season the, there was huge sleeves. And for me, you know, with the, the fact that I have all, all friends of different shape sizes and everything, I always find that these puffy sleeves are quite flattering on all body shapes. So that was really amazing to see. And it kind of added that, and, um, that fancy aspect um, during a time when we kind of need it, you know? So that was my favourite show. Yeah. Fantastic. Alejandra? I feel mine was the Maximilian, to be honest. He was the fashionist newcomer. And I think um, apart from all the silhouettes, all the garments being so sophisticated, they feel so modern, at the same time so fresh, like so young. I thought it was so interesting to uh, see how him and many other brands have gone so introspective for this season. I think because of the whole coronavirus situation, we've been going through, you know, easing in and out of lockdown for the past four or five months. And to be honest, there's nothing else to do ex uh, except, you know, analyzing your your identity. And I think he has done an amazing job at that. And it's amazing having um, a person like like him uh, doing such interesting work instead of having other brands that you know represent, um, you know, Black Lives Matter. That then they're not, you know, it's more just an image. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And John, what was your favorite? Oh. I was um, absolutely blown away by art school. Um, I felt like it's been quite some time since I've seen a show that uh, got me quite emotional actually, um, as each model came out and they strode with such confidence. And uh, something kind of as, as beautiful as a small detail as the shoulders uh, and the tailoring and how they were slightly dropped. But once you saw them from profile, they were slightly tipped forward, which kind of gave you this sense of moving forward and momentum and the hope that that uh, they spoke about. And uh, casting, of course, goes without saying, uh, being the son of a disabled mother my entire life, you know, knowing what it's like to have to pick your mother up off the ground and seeing these type of people striding down the runway it, it packed quite a wallop for me and I really have to commend them because it was, it, you know, it was so much more about just clothing. It was, a, it was truly a statement, a moment in fashion for me. It's pr probably going to be one of my most favorite shows for quite some time now because it was, mm -hmm. uh, it really delivered. It was absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah. it's really special. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say, I'll agree that casting is always impeccable. Out of all of the shows, I must say, I think, in, in fact, I might even go as far as saying that's one main contributor to them being season on season, showing like showing season on season is because their um, what they stand, their brand values and their casting is is far greater than a lot of other brands that have been on the schedule for 
sometimes decades. Um, I did think, I mean, I'll start like dissecting kind of in between because um, out of all of those, I was my personal favorite was Maximilian, but art school I think is an interesting one because Eden has taken the helm um, because obviously um, they've split. So that there, it, it, there was a reshift, a reshuffle. I'm not entirely sure why I did try to find out why. Um, I was aware from murmurs um, from various insiders that this had been something that had been coming for a long time, um, that the duo were, uh, weren't the most um, in sync of, of designers. And I think this kind of happens with a lot of duos. Um, I'm not sure whether any of you think the same, but I felt like I mentioned off air Medium Kershaw, they always used to fight. I find that designers um, that come in duos don't tend to last very long, um, longevity. So I'm hoping, and I did, I hope that Eden will be able to steer the brand into a positive direction. I thought it was a more, I predicted it would be a utilitarian style um, look, style silhouette. Um, there was the lack of kind of, I suppose, gowns. I assume that's, that, that is to do with the shift. I assume that Eden has more interest in tailoring um, and um, yeah. fitted pieces, but it would be nice to have that, I suppose, I hate the word androgynous, but I suppose more androgynous um, way of dressing. Um, because that fits the ethos of the brand and I think is more in keeping of what their customer wants. They want something that's, um, I, I used to say J.D. Anderson was like this, but I suppose authentically genderless in terms of silhouette because it doesn't hold too many um, markers in terms of gender, like gendered silhouette in terms of shaping. Um, and I think that's what they did well. Um, and I would like to see that more as we went on because a lot of the tailor pieces you actually referenced were I noticed they were larger, they were a bit more oversized and it would be nice if they could be, um, there would be more interesting things than just oversized clothing, I think. But I think it yeah. was a good, good show because they also had Celeste um, as one of the models, I think, performers as part of that, which is really interesting because she's obviously um, one of the biggest breakout um, musicians of this year, which is a weird thing to say because no one's really doing anything. <laughs> um, and this year, <laughs> this year. But um, going back to Maximilian, which I wanted to discuss, um, because that was my favourite, as I've said, off-air. I managed to talk to him um, off-air. I managed to get a copy of his press release, um, which was quite interesting. What you said is quite accurate, um, Alejandro, because it's kind of to do with that a reclamation of black elegance. So it's kind mm -hmm. of reclaiming their identity. Um, and I wondered what you lot thought about this. I thought that I think he's the most authentic brand, I suppose, yeah, yeah, I think, I think the whole material. image is insane. The whole image is insane as well. How how beautiful the pictures are and how strong they are. I was really impressed. Like they're really simple, but at the same time they're so strong, and that's what really fascinated me about them. And then again, going into the whole introspective, uh, I read that the whole collection was inspired by his uh, grandmother, and he's from. Um, Trinidad, I think, if I'm not wrong. And yes. it, it's, it's, all, it's all inspiring the carnival from Trinidad and the celebration of the, of the enslaved uh, people set free. If I'm not wrong, I think that's what the collection is based on. And I thought it was such a positive and fresh collection of uh, what we needed, really. At the moment. I mean, it's incredibly impressive because it's his first collection post-graduation, I think, as far as I'm aware, um, from research, or it's his first, I guess, public um, collection obviously he's under the conglomerate like the enormity of fashion east so um mm. that does help things a lot but i mean it was styled by ibrahim um kamara i hope i'm pronouncing that right who obviously has styled a large number of rather prominent i suppose imagery can that showcases black models um black designers um and people of color and i think is at the forefront of that kind of shift in the industry um, which I, I was pleased, and I, I find interesting with this imagery or what he his styled imagery is that you can always tell that it's him that styled it um, straight away. I find yeah, it, it was instantly recognizable for sure. And I think I think something to, that is almost needs just a little bit of care is that when you see someone like this who has such a beautiful sense of cut and proportion everyone immediately kind of starts to kind of jump on and like this pressure kind of mounts. My main thought coming out of this was, please give this beautiful person a little bit of time <laughs> and not raise them immediately to the top so that they get all this kind of, you know, expectation to deliver because there's so much promise there that I would really like to see many of the lines and ideas that they have 
developed a bit further without like, you know, this crown kind of being anointed and all this pressure coming along with that. I feel like that can be detrimental to new talent sometimes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like we're kind of past that. They are a bit of a, a kind of juggernaut uh, at the moment. They've been, they've been thrown into the spotlight because they are on Vogue today, um, as far as I'm aware. Exactly, yeah. And um, obviously, I, I assume that their pieces will be shot everywhere. But I mean, it was a fantastic team because Nasir Mazar did the hats um, or the head pieces. Um, and going back, I, I can't remember the, when the shift happened, but Nasir Mazar obviously used to do collections, but now focuses all of his time, I think, into headwear and head pieces. Um, being most known for those caps that were sold out, I think it was like 2013, 2014, that had the pencil in them that everyone seemed to um, buy many, many years back. And that, I guess, still had his, his move into headwear. I think it's got a millinery. I think it's quite an interesting because that enormous black hat, I don't know whether you can get it up on the screen, but the enormous black hat that kind of has the feathers and the frills on it, um, it mm -hmm. I think that is one of the most striking images of this entire season overall, um, just because the red backdrop to it and the the beauty of the model's skin yeah. it just yeah, kind of highlights yeah. everything so perfectly um yeah what i think is really amazing as well is finally we always speak about representation in fashion and as, as a trans woman myself it's quite mm. fresh to finally see a designer that is able to speak about its own experience i feel like so many times um people that they're not necessarily neither neither that they're not minorities uh, speak of our own experiences but they don't really understand that they haven't experienced it and we're put in the forefront as the models but then behind, uh, behind in the brand, inside the creative team, there's always barely any representation of people that actually understand those experiences. So I think it's really fresh that we're finally, hopefully, <laughs> starting to see a bit of a shift when it comes to designer teams being a bit more diverse and more inclusive, not only uh, the, the fashion models, not only the, the casting, you know, that is yeah. more real, not necessarily just an image. And that's what I really like about his collection, that there's, yeah, it feels special to me in that, in that way. Yeah. I mean, I think that is why he will get so much press is because he is, it is his first collection. And obviously, if you start that strong with that, that much of a clear direction in what you want and what you want to achieve, um, I think it's, you're going to get attention regardless of, of whether you seek it or not, um, which I thought was quite interesting. But obviously, um, as, as far as I'm aware, he hasn't even got a website from what I can find, which I thought was the most interesting thing of all of it. Um, but I mean... I will move on to other brands because obviously we've got a lot to run through. Other brands, you mentioned um, Erdem, which I had, Charlie, which I had I had vaguely seen, but I, I'm not sure whether it's an appropriate reference, but McQueen did not show on schedule, I don't think, this weekend. And I make that, that reference or that comparison because out of all of the different brands, I always see the, roman the, the romantic kind of chiffons of McQueen in the same light as perhaps Erdem. Not necessarily in terms of expertise and cut, um, because obviously McQueen, I think, is, uh, in my opinion, far superior. But um, I think Erdem, with McQueen not showing, Erdem, I, I suppose, got um, um, more of a spotlight, more more time, more air. Did you have anything to kind of talk about in terms of Erdem? Yeah, um, that's actually a really good point. I didn't, I didn't think of it that way. Um, yeah, I mean, what I loved about Erdem, again, you know, with, when we're talking about all these um, gender roles and things like that, Erdem did feel like the most traditionally feminine um, show that I've seen this season. But even then, you know, it was, it was in Woodland. Um, it was quite rustic. It was quite strong in some ways. It's, it, it is really interesting how all the shows are really changing and developing um, in terms of that. Um, would have liked to have seen a bit more diversity maybe, but um, but I, I do think it was beautiful. But yeah. yeah, and then again, like you were saying, all the shows really aren't running on time. That's like, a, and you know, some aren't showing at all, like Victoria Beckham. So that's all mm. um, interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it very interesting that everyone's sh shooting outside. Obviously it makes it, it's a logical um, response to COVID. Obviously it's safer to shoot outside than in a studio. It takes less, I suppose, mm -hmm. less precautions because you're out in the open. Um, but I find that what comes with it is this air of, because I work as a sustainable designer, everyone wants to see more um, in tune with that. They're using, I suppose, green surroundings and a more um, uh, in, in touch with nature feel to their brand identity to um, greenwash their way into, I suppose, selling alongside other brands that are perhaps more um, sustainably minded, I find. It is blurring uh, th this period as much as it is 
um, a blessing that people are having to consider their surroundings, consider how things are produced, consider perhaps producing locally because um, things aren't able to be produced outside of the UK. I find it very interesting that um, I find it very interesting that we're having this blend or this kind of mystique over what a brand as identity truly is. Um, so when you have brands like Burberry and Erdem, which are filming it all in the outdoors, it's meant to feel more natural, it's meant to feel more, and then, then they might, I think Burberry have a stance where some of their pieces are made from more na like natural cotton and things like that. Um, mm. And there are a couple of brands that did similar sort of um, showcases and said that they were, I suppose, that they were more conscious of what they were producing. It was more locally sourced. And I find that interesting because they had no other choice but to do that. Mm. Um, and it is that element of um, greenwashing. But when you say about people that I didn't show, obviously Richard Quinn didn't show. And he was on my people. I, want, I, was, I assume as with everyone, wanted to see what his collection was going to be. And he's delayed it now to October the 10th, as far as I'm aware, which is a whole three weeks um, behind schedule. So do you think that the schedule even matters? Do any of you think that the schedule even matters anymore? If I can jump in really quickly again. Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, the BFC were talking, British Fashion Council were talking, um, for those who don't know, about completely restructuring the way Fashion Week works. And obviously you're a big, um, sustainable uh, designer um, but just in terms of you know the the need that people used to feel to constantly bring out new collections like I really think that's all changing now um, and again I think maybe that was a positive thing COVID had if we can say anything yeah. positive about that I think um, it's so important that we put the not class what's the word i'm trying to, to think of the um the thought back into the things that we're producing and that we're making and again like you're saying you know people are really having to make things within the country they can't um do it abroad really anymore it's really it's becoming quite expensive one designer that i did also love um if i can just quickly talk about it was miss yeah, Sandy. i don't know if you if you know her so she produces she's just left csm she produces these beautiful like poofy um almost like Cinderella style dresses and Katie Grant put, put her um, her dresses on the last cover of Love um, which is really uh, yes. Cool. yes heard of for like a, a, a designer absolutely stunning and she just did a collaboration with Christian Cohen in New mm. York um, which again you know the fact that we can't really showcase things at the moment in the way that we did is very interesting but the fact now that we're maybe going overseas and using both of our um abilities both in one country and then mixing it with another one I, I just find it very interesting i'm sorry if it felt like i was rambling. no i think she's a very i think uh, rightly so she is a very good example because she i from what i've seen of her work it came out over the last i would say last few weeks like three four weeks so in the last month well, so it's well, all very all very fresh and i i if she if it had been um, I suppose, released over the weekend, it would be at the top of my list of people on London Fashion Week to look at. Mm. Um, I thought her collection was impeccable because it was a, it was, she's just graduated this year, which means she had to make it in okay. lockdown, right? Yeah, so she, I actually modeled them. So um, she brought out the dresses, the, the samples. I mean, they still hadn't been completely mm. sewn up properly and everything like that. And then she was asked by Christian Cohen to design this whole other range. Mm. It's completely unheard for anyway, yeah. new designer coming out and what like an achievement um but just absolutely stunning and i just thought that was really interesting as well um yeah oh could you just say the design designer's name again sorry miss sohi <laughs> miss so there we go so because uh, i think bella wanted to get something up on the screen but um i mean yeah she is a, i think she's fantastic i'm uh, but i know obviously this is to do with london fashion week but in to do with in respect to christian cohen i think it's important to note um that what he has done is fantastic because i saw those images and i was actually very wary when i saw them because i didn't see the credits and i thought he'd copied i thought he'd it'd been a copy uh, and yeah. that wouldn't like i wouldn't be surprised by that because normally a large brand because christian cohen i would uh, has got the financial ability to be able to do that and not care um and I was reading something recently about how it's so important that young designers realise that they can be um, uh, co like correspondents. They can they can be consultants. That's the word I was looking for. They can be consultants to large brands. So if a larger brand does like say her dresses and wants to incorporate that silhouette into their collection, they could be hired as a consultant to do that design or to to inform how to make that design. And therefore, there's no no I, no form of copying there's no need for diet prada <laughs> in an age where someone is brought on board to enhance the collection as opposed to it being stolen um so i think that was a really good move on christian cohen's park it's the first time i've ever seen re in recent time a uh, brand um or a larger brand take a student and a student's work and incorporate it within the collection and credit it so i agree yeah 
Yeah. But I mean, I turn... Something Turn. interesting that I noticed, well, obviously, because of uh, lockdown, the majority of brands have cut the collections nearly on half. So I think Victoria Beckham tends to do normally like 42 looks this season. I think she did 20. Many brands did 15 looks, even some even less. And I think that's quite interesting because uh, the, then the pieces become more statement pieces and they become maybe stronger and it's taking a bit um i feel like in the past a lot of the times they would do the same uh, garment the same pattern in a lot of different colors and it was all about producing as much as possible and i think for now we're having a bit of a step back uh, for example i really like the collection from um richard malone as well i thought it was really good because it was really structural and really um dreamy and, and quite fantastical of all the silhouettes but then at the same time the way he should it it was on the same model and it was all shooting in this room. It kind of gave me this reference of like the whole COVID situation that it was quite simple again. Yeah, and then the guard was a, bit of a, a dream of a fantasy, um, which is like, yeah, it, it's interesting how, you know, scaling down, I think it can be really beneficial because sometimes we get lost in so much garments, so, so many outfits, so, so many looks that sometimes the idea gets a bit diluted now. So I mean, I have, these, I have these conversations actually all the time because me and my peers being smaller designers, we normally create collections that are six to eight, six to 10 looks roughly. Yeah. Um, and that is quite, that's, that's quite small for a collection in terms of, in comparison to lots of other brands. And normally we are, I suppose, positioning ourselves in, in competition to brands um, or alongside brands that are producing 30 looks um in a season yeah, exactly. but i find the press and most people that i talk to in terms of that including buyers and potential buyers um they are actually quite interested in the fact that people are doing smaller collections they like that these people seem to like this kind of reverse and slowed pace um obviously they want option like in terms of buyers they normally want options so they want a variety of different colors in the same silhouette but normally if you do a well varied small collection you've got enough room to discuss and to perhaps discuss different colorways for certain things and change slight alterations without having to make a 40 look collection to epitomize all of these different options that a buyer could have um, and i find that very interesting because it's a conversation that seems to be coming up more and more um, in terms of that, what, what, if you would just go back, what were you saying about, because you said about obviously the size of collection, what else was it you were saying? Because there was something I was going to say there in relation to what you were discussing. Yeah, but they're just smaller and then uh, it gives more availability to maybe develop more intricate, more statement pieces. So then you may have a collection. Oh yes, Rich Malone. In looks. Yeah, yeah, I thought, I thought a beautiful collection. I was really impressed. Yeah. But at the same time, it had this essence that it was kind of respectful to the times, if you know what I mean, because it's, like, it's such a quite difficult moment in, in, in history that we're going through. And regardless, there was a lot of um, amazing development of all these really intricate silhouettes as well. The way it was shooted, it was quite, I don't know how to say it, like respectful, intimate. And it, I don't know, it made me feel connected in that sense of like the months that I spent in my room, just, you know, by myself trying to make stuff work. I don't know if it was quite... Suit. Well, I think, I think Richard Malone was kind of the epitome of true elegance. I think it was a really yeah. beautiful shoot. It was really um, tastefully done. It wasn't too much. It wasn't too little. Uh, I think the cuts of the pieces were impeccable. Um, but I mean, and he gets stronger every time. I used to think that his pieces were, um, as a lot of people did, perhaps uh, unmanageable or, or like costume pieces, stage pieces, their show pieces, essentially. They used to be, I think, some of the larger looks. But um, you can see how that's been scaled back, especially in the recent collection, how certain silhouettes from last season that perhaps would have been unmanageable or unrepeatable um, in a commercial sense uh, are much more accessible this this time but in a way which still is um, in line with his brand ethos and looks still stunning and individual it doesn't look like it's been streamlined into something that is purchasable I suppose I also find him a very interesting person because there have been a lot of murmurs about um, Ricardo Tisky at Burberry and I think that he would make a fantastic fit now I don't think that at the level that he's at in terms of where Burberry are at, I don't think that would happen. But I think that Richard Malone would make a perfect fit at Burberry based on colorways and silhouette and everything that we've seen from his previous collection and work previous. I think that would be a perfect fit for that. Um, so I think he's a very interesting designer on the schedule at the moment. And perhaps um, I would say he's risen to the upper echelons, like the top uh, this season. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, did you, I mean, did you have any, was there anything that you saw, John, that you thought was uh, outstanding? Because obviously you were referencing a lot of McQueen and there weren't, there wasn't too many 
I, I don't think there were too many brands that produced exquisite tailoring this time around, which is odd because seasons previous we had there were there've been an influx of tailoring or an influx of tailored pieces from multiple different brands and I as far as I can I can remember I don't think I've seen anything that was outstanding or exquisite or or blew me away was there anything that you thought was perhaps even at the level of McQueen I mean well that's a <laughs> that's a loaded question I'm, I'm always going to default to my favorite but <laughs> But, you know, even if you rewind a second back to um, Richard Malone, I mean, those compressed kind of carapace, you know, padded uh, waistlines, kind of Elizabethan almost, uh, that, that takes some, some skill to be able to work that out correctly and be able to kind of manipulate a form and a silhouette that balances beautifully. And my God, then do it in velvet. Like that's, I, I think that that's, uh, there's quite a few different beautiful elements there. And then, and then I, I will bounce back to art school because, uh, you know, th the amount of jackets that came down that they were showcasing, whether it was the drop shoulder or the soft relaxed shoulder, or even the pieces that kind of incorporated kind of the frayer aspects to balance out the silhouette of kind of the, you know, the waistline and the shoulders. Um, you know, and there was a few pieces of corsetry elements that were incorporated into the uh, the men's looks as well and the high-waisted trousers so I think there's like there were some little details here and there was it you know the knockdown, you know uh, drag out sharp whip uh, you know tailoring that you know we might want to see from seasons past maybe not but I think there's there was a couple of promising elements there um, and of course you know that being my favorite collection I'm I will I probably will default to that as to where I, where I liked what I saw do you know if they made it in house, or do you know if it was made externally, or uh, do you know anything about? Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I just. So I'd be very, very interested in that because obviously they are, they are in my mind and in a lot of different minds, still a small brand. Still, uh, I imagine that they are working in a studio with interns, um, like many small brands, and and make I would say about fifty percent of or more of what they show in house. So and... I'd be very, I'd be very interested in that because I mean while it wasn't perhaps my favorite collection in terms of silhouette because i didn't think it was as adventurous i do appreciate that the pieces were made extremely well in terms of tailoring um and if it was made in house that could sign for a very promising future for them sure. um yeah. because as i mentioned there aren't many brands i don't think that are doing or there weren't many brands obviously we had burberry but there obviously is a separate panel on burberry burberry is a strange one did anyone have an opinion any opinions on burberry could I add something in our school? I, I was modeling yeah, for the show. I was modeling for the show for this season. And apart, mm -hmm. I think it was, if not, I think it might have been the biggest show in terms of looks. I think there was like 35 looks. And I really agree with what you said that I think our school has this element for this collection of like maybe soft tailoring of like really small details that slowly tweak the body in a different way. I was wearing this dress that it was uh, really tight on the bust and then it, it, it had this A, a to A cut silhouette, you know, really open, really flowy. And it kind of like distorts the feminine body, but in a quite sexual but feminine way but that we're not used to, because it's always about putting, you know, the breasts together and, you know, this silhouette. And they did kind of the opposite, but it looks so romantic and, and, and beautiful. I think they, they did a really good job with, uh, with this season. The mix of the music, uh, the colors, uh, yeah, the, the, the cross-generational casting. Yeah, they're, they're a really impressive show. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I must give it to them because they the run up. They must have filmed this quite a few weeks previous because the it was um, the twenty fifth. It was the twenty fifth of August, so it was it wasn't. We oh. were not in the lockdown situation. They were not back into the yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sorry, <laughs> distraction by many different <laughs> things that came off my screen. Then um, no, but yeah, I do agree. Art school. I would very. I'm very interested, but I'm. I suppose I'm reserve a little reserved this time because it is the first collection with just Eden at the helm, and I would like to see how it pans out and what they produce next season, or when that might be. If that's not one season, um, should it be a drop? Should it be a custom look? I'd be very interested in that because I mean, going back, I do have a vast appreciation for them. One of my favorite looks, one of my favorite images, is um, of an art school look shot by Nick Knight in studio. Um, it's a like a wet look it's a black background I don't know whether Bella can find the image it's quite I can't remember the exact shoot that it is um but it's kind of like a it's 
only slightly lit and you can just see the silhouette of those because they had made a number of slip dresses in seasons previous and they were really gorgeous slip dresses it's on i think it's on kylie jenner actually um which surprisingly wasn't my um first choice favorite of models but i mean the images just looked amazing they were immaculate um so i have a vast appreciation for art school in general but i think i'm perhaps a bit more reserved because i'd like to see how the brand evolves with these shifts that they've had behind the scenes um, mm. because I'd like to see longevity really with them. Um, like I just mentioned a, a minute ago, does anyone have anything to say on Burberry? Because obviously there, there have been a lot of discussions to do with that and they technically are the biggest on, C, on schedule. I mean, really big production. Um, yeah, many models. I mean, I mean, that says it all, it says it all really, <laughs> that no one has anything to say about that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like on the whole, like this season, it hasn't been like massively grand or like there, there's been very, very few shows that have been like mind blowing, you know, and I think yeah. a lot of that is because of the time that we're in. Obviously, we, we work in fashion for the, for the very normal day to day person. If you're producing 30 odd outfits and spending hundreds of thousands on a show, it's quite insulting you know, and yeah. um, everything's just getting simplified. Everything's been drawn back. And again, like I was saying earlier, I think it's very much going back into quality over quantity. Um, yeah. But I would like to see maybe a bit more excitement next time. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna, I won't slow, because obviously I think it cost millions to do their, mm -hmm. their, even their coat, like their recent show, which is a lot of money in, in general, but I mean, it's a lot of money to be spent when everyone's scaling back at the moment. Exactly. Um, I think it was a good show at Burberry, but I don't think there was anything outstanding. And when you compare it to the other the other designers, they're on schedule. But you could also, I've been thinking about this a lot. You could spin it on its head and say that there's a lot of um, a lot of people expecting certain things from them, whereas a young younger brand or a smaller brand can be a bit more experimental, especially in times when they're everything's on its head and they don't even know if they're going to sell these looks because they don't know that people are going to want to buy them. So a smaller brand like a Richard Malone might be able to pull out a look that's a bit more ridiculous and not have to think too much about it being sellable because they're aware that the the, the stores aren't going to be buying as many looks or as many so they can be a bit more experimental whereas Burberry have to consistently keep to budgets and consistently keep to sales so I guess that's why it came across in my mind a bit bland but I mean it is each to their each to their own I think it was a nice video and a nice way of presenting only interesting thing I must say it was a, it was presented on Twitch which I thought was quite interesting have any of you used the platform before to do anything or watch anything it's basically it's, I, as far as I can gauge it's like a tv platform but interestingly enough Helsinki Fashion Week used it for their entire um schedule so all of the sh all of the shows were shown live on there um and it it, there's no feedback so it doesn't get kept on the platform you kind of watch it live like you would watch live tv and i guess that gives the air of a live show so when you're obviously when you see a show in person you don't get to rewind it and rewatch it you and i think i guess that's what the idea of um twitch is although obviously it's recorded burberry is recorded but the air the idea of it is it's live um i will subtly move on to gareth Pugh. i don't know what how much time we've got but i really wanted to mention gareth does anyone have any opinions on gareth before i bounce in because I, I know that many of you had seen the show or seen the, the images. Well, he, he said in his video that you know he basically thinks of designers as designers that kind of design collections and then there's designers that are world builders mm -hmm. and uh, I think you can definitely comfortably classify him as a world builder and the documentary um, is emotional it's you know a greatest hit it's a walk back through but it's also I don't know, it's him kind of doing what he does best. And yeah. it, it was quite a tour de force, you know, to kind of see uh, a, an ultimate British designer like himself really kind of display the, the, the kind of creme de la creme of what he has to offer. And, you know, I, I don't always, I'm not always, you know, jumping up and down about Gareth Pugh, but this, he should be very proud of what he's produced here because it is, uh, you know, it's a documentary about him. It's a documentary about current times. It's a documentary about pop culture. I mean, it is, it was, it's quite something. Yeah, I think it was a really hopeful, hopeful message. It was really strong in my opinion. I really enjoyed it. And I think the way you portrayed all the, all the activists that modeled the clothes as this kind of like, um, figure statements. Uh, I feel like we, with the whole COVID situation, we were having a lot of discussion about the, 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 
the sculptures that we have in our cities and, and how they influence our culture. And I thought it was in a way, I feel like related to that, the way they were represented and, and, and photographed, it was really powerful, yeah. Well, I mean, similar to, in a similar light, I suppose, to art school, Gareth is one of these consistent people that has uh, created a world and been very much for his own little community um, in terms of uplifting LGBT community and minorities um, and has consistently done that whether the press is listening or not really throughout the years and I find uh, that quite commendable because obviously he's well now he, he should be seen as one of the largest designers on schedule obviously he doesn't always show on schedule he kind of does what he he wants and I don't think he cares too much whether um, whether people are dying to see a collection or not he will put it out when it's ready for him and I think that's always quite refreshing but I mean, because he produced the film, which you referenced, John, and then most recently, I think in the last week, he released the collection, which was 13 looks. And the 13 looks were based off of, I'm right in saying, 13 songs. Um, I'm not sure, it doesn't list the songs on here. Um, oh, and 13 explosive fashion film shorts. So I assume that encompasses your film that you mentioned. And the full... Uh, I think uh, half, about half the collection to the full collection was shown at Christie's as well. So you could book appointments, which um, which goes back into the idea of uh, old school fashion in that people would go to see it if they needed to see it, if they wanted to see it. And it wasn't open to all kind of thing. The images are open to all as with previous. So the editorials like us, like the normal people can consume those images on Instagram through social media. But to actually see the clothing in person, you had to book an appointment for it. And um, as far as I'm aware, this was uh, open to the public, so you could buy a ticket if you were a member of the public. But I think the concept of buy or of, of making an appointment to go and see clothing is how where the industry will go personally. I don't know about all of you. What do you think in terms of that? Well, during any times of hardship or you know worldly events like if we look back to the 50s and um you know Dior's new look and things like that whenever thing and, and, and after the war sorry um you know we we tend to revert back to to simpler and um I think it's interesting that he's now opening up to the public and I'm sure a lot of that will help with funds and stuff like that which is need. but um it's it, I, I quite like the fact that a lot of these fashion brands are becoming a bit more welcoming anyway and a bit more inclusive. And that's quite interesting um, in a way. I don't know if you, what, what you think, but um, yeah. It's just, it's, yeah just I mean, it's just very interesting during, you know, global crises or, you know, where it affects everyone, how fashion can uplift you, but it can also become quite welcoming. Yeah, I mean, I personally, I agree that I think fashion should be like, inclusive and it should be open to people to consume but I think there should be a separation we've got to a point where you, we feel a lot of people feel like you need to invite everyone and anyone to the show and I think that's not the place that's not the time or the place for those people and that's not because I want it to be a closed shop and elitist idea I, I think that the people that go to the show and the people that see the clothes first should be the buyers should be that which it, most of the time it is because even when it's a see now buy now sort of style thing there's a show before the show um and I think that the only shows should be internal and then the things that the public sees are images and then you kind of create two worlds, a public world and a private world. And I don't, I think we've got to a point or before COVID where they kind of merged and everyone wanted everything to be inclusive to, to everyone. And I don't think that that works to be honest, because I think when you have appointments for clothes, like going back to the beginnings of shows, it was just people who, it was editors, it was buyers, it was people, of note, I guess. Um, and obviously you've got to make, if we move towards a more inclusive industry, then we won't have to worry about it being an elitist concept of having people that are important at those events because the, the industry will be diverse in itself and then they will select the images and that will be disseminated down to the public. And I think that's kind of how we will go. So I think in my mind, it makes so much sense, not just because of COVID, but in general that we move to a, an appointment based system where we don't have to show these grand or, or do these grand shows but do them for the people that are important to see they don't have a front row of influencers mm. like worry about the people that are the editors the buyers do it go back to that sort of system but also consider that you need to produce images for the public because you need to keep that side of it and I think that's how 
we will perhaps develop? I don't know, what do you lot think? How do you think that the system will develop? That system could be interesting as long as it still leaves a narrative open for critical discussion. We yes. already have way too many reviews that are like, I mean, I can't even remember the last time I read a critical review of a designer. And I, if I find that slightly almost disrespectful because you know a designer should also get feedback from people that are in the know and that have seen shows and understand the design process and the industry and how that works. So, you know, while no one wants to be torn down or ridiculed or whatever, but criticism can be a good thing to make momentum moving forward. So, you know, if you if you you know pad your front row with everyone that's going to you know adore you and shower you with kisses and flowers that could be prob problematic, you know, when it comes to helping a, a designer evolve. Well, I mean, I think that kind of perhaps comes part and parcel with opening up to the public, opening up to influencers. So you have a paid front row, like you have a front row that are paid to be Absolutely. there because, Absolutely. and because so they're all going to Panda. So if we moved to a more exclusive system where it is just writers, buyers and stylists, they will be more critical because they will be looking for pieces they can shoot. And if they sit there and there's nothing they can shoot, of course they're going to give an opinion um, that is negative or that is con constructive towards that. But the only, I guess, I, I hope that in light of how, we, how people are working out at the moment, it won't make it reverse it back to an elitist idea. We need to keep it inclusive yes. and we need to keep it accessible. But in order to do that, we need to, the industry needs to shift to that point before we perhaps make it more exclusive in terms of those initial showings. Uh, and at the same time, we need to, as brands, they need to remember to include the public, but include them in a tactical way, perhaps, in terms of showing them what they need. Because the, the public doesn't necessarily know what they want to see. We've got to a point where um, we think that everyone's Twitter opinion and Instagram opinion is indicative of what a brand should be making. But the public only knows what it wants based on what it is told it wants. We like we the creatives, the creators influence what trends influence what people want. So it would be, uh, I think you need to keep the public informed in what like give them images, give them something to digest, but don't open up perhaps to that first showing where they can the public who are uninformed can criticize pieces and criticize you want the people who know how to cut clothes you know how to dress people in a certain way who form these images to criticize it it's a it's a very fine line but i think covid perhaps has um expedited that uh, this shift that is needed so that we're now thinking about moving it into a more manageable system but also remaining inclusive do any of you think, have any other opinions on how we should perhaps or how even how the bfc worked it this season do you think it was it was good do you think they worked it well do you think do you like their new system online because everything's digital their web they've got a new website I think, you to... I think it was it's, it's quite hard when it comes to, uh, to this industry i think with the whole covid situation uh, the creative industry has been hit really hard when it comes to funding for example and I, I, I know of a lot of uh, young designers that haven't been able to access funding because obviously there's not funding for everyone. And I think that's been a quite harsh pill to swallow for, for many, many young designers. And of course, the, um, the way the funding was distributed, it's just, it's just uh, quite hard when it comes to creative industry to maintain it uh, and to, to maintain the brand in, in, in a situation like this. So I think that, that's been quite tricky uh, for the fashion system. Yeah, I mean, I must say from discussions I've had with the BFC, they, because obviously the COVID fund went to mostly, uh, as far as I can see, known brands, brands yeah. that are, uh, um, but I, I arguably needed that help to float through, I suppose. Um, but that does make it more difficult for smaller brands that are, however, from discussion with them, they have opened up and offered mentorship schemes, um, advice. And obviously, if you are a young brand, you are have the opportunity to list your work on the British Fashion Council's website which is a great leverage, um, a great, um, I suppose, name to put on your CV, a name to put to your work. So I, I think they're trying the best that they can, but it's a very yeah. difficult situation because you can't, in any, any sense of the word, you can't cater to everyone all the time. Um, so they're having to navigate this difficult situation, um, holding the whole industry to get together. Um, I must, I don't know, I think we might have come to like, roughly about 45 minutes ish did anyone have anything that you wanted to say or anyone you wanted to shout about um or anything you wanted to talk about that you think we haven't covered 
I just think it's wonderful how this campaign is allowing a lot of new designers to come to the forefront, you know, like Maximilian, for example, um, Miss Sohi, who I mentioned before, giving all these new designers a space. And I think that's really, really exciting. And, you know, I, I know you were saying that, you know, um, which I agree with you on, uh, that shows shouldn't be accessible to every influencer under the sun. Um, but if social media can do one good thing, it's to acknowledge this talent um, at a time when we really need it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, does anyone else have anything to add to that or anything to add in general in terms of we've I seen? Think it's been really interesting. Uh, season. Okay. I think it's, it's been way more uh, better curated than the last season. I feel because of the whole COVID situation, the last season was a bit maybe more messy and no one really knew how to react. And it's been interesting to see uh, the different ways that designers have dealt with uh, the whole situation and how we have a slightly shift um, in a lot of aspects that the industry is now a bit slower, a bit smaller, but at the same time, more mindful. So it's interesting um, how this whole situation has encouraged so many conversations that were still needed for so long, but we needed of something like this to happen sadly to restructure the, the industry. And I think there's this, I think there's something really positive to take out of yeah. this whole drama, <laughs> but, but it is interesting. Yeah, I think it's been more fin it's more finesse this time. For like in June, that I think they were just working things out, and a lot of people dropped out. Mm -hmm. And there were, that was also the emergence of um, the mass Black Lives Matter protest. So it felt a bit disingenuous to be talking about fashion, to be doing, fr I suppose, frivolous things in, in terms of that. So it was a very weird time last time. Whereas this time they've had the they've had the months to finesse the system to, fin to work out how it would work. So you had to split physical and digital. Um, I must just add, on terms of what you just said, Charlie, and to, to do with influencers, I obviously didn't mention that, but it is a double-edged sword because when you do make the world more ex exclusive, influencers do also have um, a part to play. But I guess it's just make sure that the people that are influencing are the right people, are the people that know what they're talking, as opposed to just someone that is um, cool for the sake of cool, a TikToker that's just made it overnight. Do you know what I mean? It needs to be the people that know and you know really believe in what you're saying and, and have an opinion because everyone wants to join the fashion industry but it's such an art and you know you can just see that from the from the collections we've just seen um but it really is something to be proud of and i want fashion to go back to that point rather than just you know spewing out all these different clothes for for no real reason yeah, yeah. substance is what we need <laughs> substance right yeah. um no, I was just going to say, speaking of substance, as somebody who continues to look both backwards and forwards in what I do, um, I just, I truly hope that diversity continues to be a champion in every single thing that everyone does. Um, it's been one of the most vibrant, colorful seasons ever, and that just can't stop. It can't get more colorful. I mean, they just need to keep it going, keep it going. And uh, because, it, I mean, even the difference between now and five years ago is is insane, but I still I still think there's lots of work to do. Yeah. Last year. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like we mentioned off off air, if you look at September issues, all most of the covers um, are inclusive in terms of even like down to new designers. So, like you said on the cover of Love magazine, and also in terms of models of color and diversity in that in that sense, there is a much more representation. Uh, we're start. I think we're starting to see um, trans non-binary representation, but I I can see, I, and I wish that was greater. But obviously, with uh, people like J.K. Rowling on the prowl, I I think we we're we're in a, it's a contentious subject. But I hope that um, that that will come to the forefront in the same light that Black Lives Matter has, so that we get the representation throughout of all different types of people, all different types of bodies, all different types of skin uh, like skin color i hope that this is and i hope that it's genuine because yeah. i just want obviously... to get it out of tokenism you know i feel when it comes to um trans lgbt and gender non-conforming um representation all the times we go for the most easy the most you know traditional looking um beautiful standard uh, trans uh, personas or models and i think um I'll be really interested in seeing maybe more uh, trans women in the runway that maybe don't fit perfectly with with, with this perception that we have of this over the top super glam uh, femininity. And uh, but this a really big conversation to be had about all of that, that I hope it keeps growing. Um, 
while the collections move forward. I mean, well, it's also it also makes sense for the brands to do so because it's an enormous sector to move into. But I just like I said, I hope that it's genuine, and I hope people don't as much as I want it to it to happen. I hope that there is the infrastructure for them to have longevity with the with this level of inclusivity, and it isn't just for commercial gains right now. Um, I think that kind of brings, I suppose, our panel to a close. So. Thank, I will say <laughs> thank you to um, all of my panelists um, and thank you for everyone watching. For extensive Fashion Week coverage, um, be sure to visit the Harrods fifth floor and showstudio.com. If you're watching via Show Studios YouTube, be sure to like, comment and subscribe below and we will see you next time. In the meantime, stay groovy. Bye. <laughs>